Well, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Johnsons, for leading us into worship tonight. And as our student ministry's pastor and his wife, and they're going to head over next door and be with the high school students right now. Kind of. You know, I honestly, truly believe that God is going to be speaking directly to you tonight through his word. And tonight we're going to be looking in the Old Testament. We look in the Old Testament at a prophet named Elisha. We're going to be looking at his life and his calling and how he was in pursuit. And speaking of the word pursuit, there's a friend of mine a couple weeks ago. He is a police officer here in Charleston. He's been on the uh, force for probably around 17 years or so. And a couple weeks ago, he was sharing the story with me as there were some undercover cops on the west side. And I guess they were doing some type of operation sting or so forth. And they called up my friend and they said, hey, will you pull up behind this car and you're in a regular vehicle in your uniform? And so my friend comes and he pulls behind this car and in this vehicle, there are a massive amount of people. There's multiple people in this vehicle. And as soon as Chad stopped behind this car, the passenger got up and just took off on foot, just ran. It's paranoid. So instantly, Chad leaves out of his car, goes in full pursuit, going after the suspect. Okay, he's running, he's chasing this guy, and honestly, as I'm listening to Chad tell the story, I think I feel like I'm watching an action film, because he's hopping over fences, he's dodging dogs and bushes, and he's going through houses and all this stuff. Long story short, he catches up to the, uh, the suspect, and he arrests him, and, he, and he, founds, he finds a very large amount of drugs on this man. But there's something interesting. While Chad was in pursuit... Chad was no holds barred, nothing back. He was looking forward, not looking back. And as he's arresting this suspect, he realizes that there was no backup. His backup was at the car, you know, dealing with the other suspects. And tonight, like Chad, we're going to be looking at the life and calling of Elisha and how he was in pursuit and what that looks like for us. Let's go on there. Father God, I'm humbled. I really am. I'm humbled that we have the opportunity to come into your house and to hear from you, your very spoken word. Father, I pray tonight that hearts would be softened and that your spirit, Father, that it would just impound us Convict us. Draw us to you. Father, let it be your words of your mouth and not of my own. In your heavenly name, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. If you will, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, why is you turning there? I want to give you the, the context, the, the background, the text. For tonight, the book of Kings is actually about two groups of people. Can you guess the first one? It's kings. And the second group of people are prophets. Now, the kings were, they were judged depending on if they were disobedient or obedient unto God. And the prophets, their main job was to minister to the people to draw them close to draw them back to the heart of God. Elijah was a very bold and daring prophet. His successor, Elisha, is the one we'll be looking at tonight. Elisha was his successor. He was his mentee. He won the second portion. He won the second blessing from Elisha. Or from Elijah, I'm sorry. Elisha actually performed more miracles than any other person in Scripture besides Jesus himself. His name means, my God is my salvation. Now, what's interesting when we look at the text tonight, Elisha was an ordinary guy. 
He wasn't some spiritual guru. He wasn't a monk. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a priest. He was an ordinary guy. To the point, he was actually a farmer working on his parents' farm. And the, the text that we're going to be looking at tonight took place in 9th century B.C. And that's important to know because in 9th century B.C., Israel was divided. There was two different kingdoms going on. And during that time, there was a lot of people who were worshiping the false god of Baal. And during that time, Israel had the worst king of its history. And the guy's name was King Ahab. So all of this is taking place during the text that we'll be looking at tonight. Now, if you can, I would like us to stand for the reading of God's word. Here's the reason why. Some of you guys might be saying, you know, why, why are we doing this? In Hebrew culture, when a prophet came to the town, when a rabbi spoke and pulled out the scroll and he kissed it and he showed the text to the people, it was a reminder to the people that it is not the prophet who is speaking. So therefore, tonight is a reminder that not Pastor Adam, not Adam Warren Stotler is speaking to you. But it was a reminder that God, through his holy word, the spirit of God, speaks directly to us. Amen. Verse 19. First Kings chapter 19, verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate it. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. The word of God for the people of God. You guys may be sitting there. Verse 19, it says, so Elijah, it's kind of confusing sometimes. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving 12 pair. So God just gave Elijah this command. He traveled from Mount Horeb, traveled a very long distance to find Elisha. The word find means to search out. He didn't just show up to his house and be like, hey, there you are. I mean, he had to find him out. And when he does, he comes across, the text tells us that Elisha is plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Okay, so first and foremost, when we look at the text, anyone who owned oxen during that day, you would have had a little bit of money. Let alone 12 implies that they were very wealthy. 12 oxen, it's 16 hitch. So with 12 oxen also implies they would have had a lot of land. It was a common practice in that day to have oxen. You would have had servants. Each servant would have been on the first team of hitch. And so therefore the line goes all the way back and Elisha would have the 12th pair. So you can imagine Elisha shows up and he's watching these guys go around and around and around. But you ever think about this? Elisha, as he's plowing oxen, what is he looking at day in and day out? He's looking at oxen rear. He's looking at oxen behind like day in and day in. That, that's got to get old. Okay? My, my point is this. There are some times in our lives we do the same thing over and over. We get in this routine. It kind of becomes mundane. You know, some of us, you know, we get up, uh, we have our own routine, coffee, newspaper, we go to work, and it's just the same old, same old. And we get very complacent. You know, for me, I was a stay-at-home dad for almost two years with our youngest son. I was working on my master's. And I'm not going to lie, there are some days it just seemed like getting up, feed, diapers, nap, study, feed, Diapers, nap, study, feed, diapers, nap, study. And it was just this continual cycle. My point is this. There are times we lose sight of pursuing God when we get into the same old, same old. And if you look at the verse, it 
come back to it, it says, Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Now for some of you all, cloak, and it might say mantle. Imagine, if you will, that they're plowing, and they, they see this guy just like staring at him, and Elijah's just like, nope, 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 yes. And he throws, in essence, his cloak, his mantle, animal skins, over him. Now, animal skins, that cloak, that mantle is very important for any person who has that. Because it's used for several reasons. It can be used for sleeping, like a sling bag. It's used to sit on. It's used for, for protection from the weather. Matter of fact, you can throw a bunch of stuff in it. You can use it as like a, a luggage carrier. But Elisha recognized the symbolism in that. Elisha was saying, when he threw that over Elisha, you are going to be my successor. Everything from heaven that God has given me, my power, my authority, is now going to be bestowed upon you. What I know, you're going to know. You're going to be my student now. My blessings are going to become your blessings. And when we read further on the text, Elisha realized the calling in his life. At this very point, at this very point in time, God was calling Elisha. He was calling him out to pursue him. He was calling him out to pursue him. And even though Elijah, Elijah didn't know all the details, he still went. So that's my principle tonight that we're going to just constantly go over. You're not always going to understand the details of why God calls you out to do something. Let me repeat that. You're not always going to understand why God calls you out to do something. Here is a man who was plowing day in and day out. This guy shows up on him, throws his cloak on He understands the symbolism of that. Let us look at the next verse. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So, do you, do you understand? You're reading the text. He literally left, leaving this, and ran after Elijah and basically saying, hey, wait up, wait up, wait up. I, I, I get this. I understand this. It's implied here when he, when he came to throw the cloak, the mantle over him. He understood the symbolism that he is being called to God. He's pursuing God. Now, if you look in the verse where it says, go back, that is implying, do as you please. But keep in mind that when you do go back, it's going to be very short. Remember who you're being called by. Remember who you're pursuing. It's God himself. So don't take long. Don't go do what you got to do, but don't take long. Now, I want you guys to notice another thing. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elisha. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said. Then I will come with you. Go back, Elisha replied. What have I done to you? Notice how he didn't make a list of pros and cons of what to do, what not to do. Notice how he didn't consult anybody. Notice how he didn't, forgive me for saying this, notice how he didn't even pray about this. But the point is that he recognized that God was in the very midst of this situation. He was in the very midst of this situation, even though he didn't understand all of the details or the why. He understood that God was in the midst of the situation, and I'm going to pursue him. Francis Chan is an author and a, and a pastor, and he wrote a book called Crazy Love. At the end of the, near the end of the book of Crazy Love, he gives this illustration of this life story of his that God called him to uh, just up in one day in the living room, go feed the homeless in downtown Los Angeles. Did he hear an audible voice? No. Did he pray about it? No. He just was beating and did it. And Francis in his book was telling us, like so many times we do, did you pray about going to Walmart or Target? No, you just chose one. Did you pray about getting up this morning and exercising or watching the game yesterday? No. 
You spray about what vacation you're going on? Probably not. My point is this. None of those are bad. None of those are wrong. But those take back seats to the prior of us pursuing God. Because here's what it looks like. Pursuing equals obedience. Obedience equals passion for the Lord. So when we put ourselves in a spiritual position, when we're in pursuit, then we're ready to obey immediately. Think about it. When Chad, my friend, the officer, if he didn't go through training, I can honestly tell you that he wouldn't have been able to run a mile or so to catch this guy. He wouldn't have known all the logistics and strategies of what to do of how to handle this guy. But he was prepared. He was ready. The same thing with us. We have to be spiritually ready. We have to be in a posture of being in pursuit. So when we're in a posture of spiritual readiness, even though we don't know what's going to happen a year from now or so forth, we can be ready. We can be ready to obey immediately when the time comes. And so God speaks to us just like he did Elisha and Elijah. And a lot of times, though, many times, God doesn't tell us here are the full details. He didn't tell us the full details. But he gives us, hey, here is your next move. Here is your next step. And he does it with one word. You look at verses 15. So the Lord said to him, go. Look at verses 20. Go. Told Abraham, go. Told Peter, come. Many times in our lives, God is trying to communicate to us with one word. And I don't know what that word may be for you. You would know that word between you and God. Maybe tonight, I don't know. Maybe some of you all have maybe had uh, a struggling marriage. I don't know. And God says, stay. You're not going to completely understand the details. I want you to stay. Some of you all here tonight, your, your grandparents, your parents, your aunts, your uncles, of your nieces, of your nephews, of your grandparents, of your children, and those children are going through a very difficult time. They're going through a very difficult time. And the only thing that God says, He speaks to you and says one word. It might be two words. It might be pray. Or it might be hope. You're not going to completely understand all the details. But pray unto me. Talk with me. I am the living hope. I will resolve this situation. Some of you, maybe you've been coming to church for a while. Maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe years. And the one word that God is communicating to you is give. Maybe there's some of you guys here tonight that you have been searching your entire life for fulfillment. You've got this black hole. And you're trying to just fill this black hole with anything and everything. Well, I'm here to tell you, you're not going to find it. Because only Jesus Christ can truly satisfy you. That's why God designed you and wired you, created you to be in a personal relationship with Him. To have life to the fullest, to have eternal life, to break you of the bondage of sin. And that's what happened. Sin entered the world and broke us apart from a holy and righteous God. Why do you think we think the way that we think? We do the way we do. Our attitudes are so big. That's not human nature. That's called sin. But yet, God could have had anything in this world. And yet, He desires to have a relationship with us. So what's He do? He sends His Son to take your guilt, your shame, your junk, and put it upon Himself who was sinless to be nailed to a cross. Be crucified. Die. Three days later, rise from the grave. 
He conquered Satan. He conquered death. Why? So that you and I can have a relationship with God. Amen. So that we can have eternal life. But it doesn't stop there. So you can break the bondage of sin. To change the hearts from the inside out. Only by Jesus Christ who is still alive and risen today. Amen. Some of you all, it might be give. Give your time. Volunteer. Give your, give your God-given abilities that God has given you. To fulfill the purpose of his kingdom. Whether it's here at this church or in Charleston or somewhere. But give your time. It might be giving your, your resources. I don't know what it is. Some of you all, it may be there is a major decision going on right now in your life. You have no idea where to go, who to turn to. But there is a major decision that is taking place in your life right now. And God says one word. He says, trust. You may not understand completely the details of why I'm trying to do something, but I want you to trust in me. You need to trust in me. I have this situation taken care of. You're not always going to understand the details of why God calls you out to do something. So after he talks to Elijah, he says, hey man, can I, can I go back and tell my mom and my pops and that we head on out. He tells him, yeah, go, go back. Do as you please. Verse 21, it says, So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became a servant. So, in essence... To, to simplify this, he slaughtered the oxen, slaughtered the cows, did a bonfire, and cooked steaks for everybody. That's basically what happened. He had this farewell feast to his family and friends. Here is the sacrifice, God. I recognize, I recognize who you are. I'm going to pursue you. Family, friends, zip. Peace out. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to pursue God in every day and every aspect of my life. Now watch this. So Elisha left him and went back. Notice, though, that Elisha didn't say, hey, let's put the oxen in the shed and let's put the equipment in the shed. And Elisha, if this doesn't work back, man, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to come back to my job. This is my wealth and this is my job. He planned, he burned, he burned option B. There is no option B. Do you recognize that? There is no option B. 2011, 9-11-11, God called my family to this church. For almost two years, like I said, I've been a stay-at-home dad, work on my master's. When my time came for almost graduation, I'm in this dialogue with God. Why did you bring my family out here? I see several factors I want to so bad, I want to serve this community, I want to serve these people, I'd love to be here, but this is not your will. I'll go anywhere else. But here's the crazy thing. Liberty has this thing called LU Connect. You fill out your resume, you sit it into this thing, and over 3,000 different businesses and companies worldwide, LU gets dibs pretty much on those positions before anybody else. <laughs> and the one word that God was telling me was stay. It was stay. And here I am kind of with God. I'm like, this is crazy. People are telling me, Adam, like, literally, that's not smart. That's really stupid to put all your eggs in one basket, to burn all the bridges, to burn all your options. And as I fill out that resume, I didn't hit this in, but I said, God, I'm believing on you that you want us to stay. That's exactly what Elisha did. Elisha pursued the Lord. He had this heart, he had this desire to pursue God in every aspect, in every venue of his life. To the point where he was willing to be the servant, willing to be the aide, willing to be the mentee, the disciple of Elisha. It's amazing if you read further on in 1 Kings of what God did in Elisha's life. 
But Elisha didn't know that right then, right there. He didn't know all of the details. And especially during a dark, chaotic, destructive period of King Ahab. Hmm. Let me choose wealth and what I'm used to. And, yeah, I'll praise God, you know, blah, 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 blah. Or let me follow Elijah during the most evilest, darkest times in Israel's history under King Ahab. Yeah, sign me up. That sounds like good. Now, I'm not saying go into work tomorrow and, and, and call, you know, your, your, your co-workers oxen rears or behinds. And I'm not saying, man, I'm through with work and burn the building down. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is know that you know that you know that you know, keyword know, that the Lord wants you to pursue him. Then, keyword, you move into that direction. See, I honestly, I truly believe tonight, wholeheartedly, I believe there's going to be some of you all tonight that you're going to have a plow burning faith. That when you step out of these doors tonight, a plow burning faith, that you're pursuing God in every venue, every aspect of your life. It's going to look completely different from here on out. And I just want to share a couple of plow burning people that I know. There is a, there is a woman and her family by the name of Heather Cabinet. And uh, she was highly addicted to drugs. When she repented and gave her life to the Lord, God gave her a vision of a ministry to reach the people who weren't really coming inside the church. About two years ago, <laughs> she left her house. Her parents left her house. Her brother left her house. God gave them a ministry building in the Charleston area in Bell. That entire family now lives in that building. Why? Because they're pursuing God. They're being the hands and feet of Jesus. They're reaching the outcasts of society. They're reaching the people with uh, addiction problems, runaway teens, teen pregnancy. They're praying with people. They're counseling. They're ministering to these people. But they burned their options. There was no option B. Amen. Amen. You know, I just, I have another plow burning couple that I know. They're here with us tonight, and I wasn't really going to put this in until I saw them. You know, there is a, there's a couple here tonight that are friends of mine, and uh, they did this relationship overseas for over years. They met on a missions trip. <laughs> and the wife, the wife pursued God in every aspect of of her life to the point where she said, God, you want me to marry this man? I'll wait. She waited for years, but she left everything. She left her country halfway across the world to pursue God and the godly marriage that he put them in to be. I have another gentleman here that's with me tonight. I've been discipling for months. And when I first got up with this gentleman, this gentleman had a heart for the Lord. He had a lot of questions. He was kind of anti, you know, don't have a home church, anti, small group, just different things. But it came to a point in his life where he said, Lord, I want to pursue you. I want to know you. To the point a couple weeks later, I said, Chad, is that really real? He said, yeah. I said, all right, cool, you're teaching the BBS. And then this is the same guy who's going to be teaching our life groups for the next four weeks. This is the same guy who's going to be opening up his house for a small group, for a home life group next year. His plow burning faith, he said, man, I'm tired of my anxiety, I'm tired of my doubts, I'm tired of everything, of my past issues. I'm pursuing you, God. What do you want? My last one is friends of mine who met at a Bible Institute. And, uh, when they got out of missionary or when they got out of uh, Bible, uh, Bible Institute, Word of Life, they were, they were praying of, where do you want us to be, God? And God laid on their hearts when they are pursuing God. All right, cool. I'm going to stretch you. Younger 20s, you're going to leave everything behind. 
You can leave family, friends, your home church. You can be out of debt. You can sell your car. And I'm going to take you all the way halfway across the world, and you're going to be in Johannesburg, South Africa. I want you to pursue me. That is cloud burning faith. So my question to you tonight is this. What is keeping you from pursuing God? What is keeping you from pursuing God and having a cloud burning faith? I don't know what that is. Maybe it's some type of sin that is, that is holding you back. Maybe it's some type of anxiety. Maybe it's some type of fear. Maybe it's some type of doubt. Whatever it is, don't let it hinder you in your relationship of pursuing God. You're not always going to understand the details of why God caused you to do something. Some of us are like me when I was little. You know, when I was when I was young, probably all the way to sixth grade. Uh, probably would have had longer if I'm on it to play, but I had this security blanket. It was a Sesame security blanket. It had, you know, Big Bird and all the Sesame characters on it. And I'd carry around that thing everywhere I went. I just, I just hold on tight to it. And so it started getting shredded, and finally my mom just threw it away. My point is this, though. Some of you all, you think that you're holding on to whatever you think is your security. But God is calling you out to pursue him. You may be looking at what Elisha was looking at, oxen today. But tomorrow, God is calling you to pursue him. Because what's going to happen is when you're in a spiritual position of readiness to obey immediately and to pursue him, God is going to use you. He's going to do something in you, for you, and through you for the purposes of his kingdom, for his glory. Some of you all, you may be wondering tonight, I want to pursue you, Lord. I want to pursue you. Here I am. I want to pursue you. I want you to stretch me out to the point where I'm willing to do anything for you, even if it means fill in the blank. And your prayer is, Lord, I, I want to be overwhelmed with you. I want to be completely spiritually ready to be in pursuit of you. Tonight, I'll leave you all with this question. What is one step of obedience you can take this week to respond to what God is asking you to do? Let me repeat that if anybody wants to write this down. What is one step of obedience you can take this week to respond to what God is is asking you to do. You go home tonight. You're going to get in your bed. You're going to put wood over you. You're going to put a sheet over you. You're going to put a bed spread. You're going to put a blanket. Some of you might put a Snuggie on when you're on the couch. Whatever the case may be, next time you put something over you, let it be a reminder of what Elisha was putting on or what Elijah was putting on Elisha. The cloak, the mantle, and what that represents. So next time you get in bed, you put sheets over you and it's covering you. Let that be a reminder. Let that be a symbolism that God wants you to pursue him in every aspect, every venue of your life. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, because of your son, that we can come in your presence and we can worship you. We can praise you. We can exalt and glorify you. Father, I pray that tonight... Father, that we don't walk out these doors and say, oh, that's a good message. But Father, we take it to heart. And we're asking the question, Lord, what do you want of me? How can I be spiritually ready to obey you immediately in any venue, any aspect of my life? I'm ready to pursue you. Father, we give this unto you. In your holy name, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Let's stand.